Hello everyone, welcome back to another Swans Cast podcast. It's been a little bit of time since the last one and we can only apologise for the delay, but uh, there's good reason. I did kind of allude to it in a couple of videos ago, a lot going on in personal side of things for both of us, but I myself, we just had uh, another Jack born to the world, so that's the reason, the main reason for our lack of content, so not to speak loads about it or make a load of excuses, but yeah, a little bit tired, a lot going on. Also, just kind of in the middle of moving house, so kind of two things at one once. Bit difficult to sit down sometimes and record, so that's why the content's not as frequent and regular as we would like it to be. And don't don't get us wrong, we are a bit gutted that we missed all of the build up to the South Wales Derby. Usually, one of the biggest weeks for obviously delivering content and having a discussion and chatting to everyone listening, and we usually love doing that, but it's just one of those things sometimes life gets in the way, unfortunately, but we're back today. I know it's an international break, so it gives us a little bit of um, a, a gap, I guess, to kind of get our uh, stuff in order, but we can talk positively about the last game because we managed to win the South Wales Derby, so I'm sure everyone is aware fully of the result of that game. So Swansea won 2-0, and we're here to discuss that. And this seems like a regular occurrence for us to jump on and chat about good results in this fixture. Bar the one back in, what was it, September, October last year. Uh, yeah. Obviously, it was a blip in the, uh, in the in the system. And there was normal service resumed as Swansea lead the way again in the uh, bragging rights of football in South Wales. So, Lee, welcome back after a couple of weeks, of course. I know you've had a couple of things going on too, been very busy yourself, but good always... To discuss such a victory once more. Yeah, well, I thought we better we better end our hiatus for this one. We yeah, be, and before you start, sorry, I wanted to say as well, we have had some messages asking like where the stuff is, and we appreciate all the support. And yeah. it is nice to hear when we haven't got stuff going out there that people miss it because it, you know, that's why we want to kind of do it. Really, is because people enjoy listening to what we have to say. Um, so yeah, thanks for all of the support in that regard as well. But yeah, sorry Lee, to cut you off there. Yeah, no, I think it was it was a good time to uh, to end the break uh, with yeah. uh, with with the Cardiff win. So yeah, yeah, it's been it's been manic, isn't it? I've been preparing to move myself and shout out to a couple of friends who were going through a difficult time. One name names, but. Um, We've been helping out with them as well, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a man a couple of weeks. So, but it's, it's good to be back now. Yeah, and obviously we've had Ben come in to help us as well. This is very last minute; otherwise, probably would have been here for this one too. So, thanks to Ben, who's been a big part of the podcasts recently. Um, I'm sure you'll see a lot more of him going forward. So, yeah, we appreciate his support as well. But yeah, so let's talk about the football. Then it was a little bit of a longer introduction, but just to give you a bit of context about what's going on, do aim to get back to the regular stuff. Um, and the match previews and everything. I'm not going to give a time scale of and promise when that will be, but it will come back um, definitely. Okay, so we haven't discussed the prior match to the Cardiff game, which was Bristol. We're not going to go into too much detail about that. This will be primarily focused on the Derby win, <clears throat> but we might touch on it if you want to as well, Lee, when you're discussing anything just kind of touch on it because the kind of narrative between the two games was quite stark in contrast. And I do think there's some interesting points to be raised about the general reaction to losing the the Bristol game. And at the time, you could argue it was three derby games, three defeats this season up to that point and a lot of pressure going then into the Cardiff game where obviously we managed to come out with a win. That is the, the real derby, you know, Bristol, call it a half derby or something. But um, the main one is the important one. We got back to winning ways there but it was just interesting to see the stark contrast of the situation the club is in after Bristol game and what people were saying compared to what they were then saying after the Cardiff game um, as if like an overnight fix had happened and I know you had some thoughts about that earlier on when we were kind of discussing <laughs> prior to the video so maybe that's a good place to start before we go into detail about the match itself. Yeah I just I was the, the Bristol game baffled me because I thought, you know, it was it was out of character because I think we improved a lot before that. I know we haven't we haven't caught up in a while, but I think like we were starting to, I wouldn't say necessarily hit form, but we had a couple of better results and we'd seen improvements. You know, like Sunderland away and we got a win against Blackburn. I think they were really good signs. And then the Bristol performance was bad. I'm not going to hide behind that. It was awful. And then you just I, I you know you should probably never do it. But I opened Twitter and. 
just the just the level of negativity. I just I couldn't I couldn't fathom why it was so bad. So I put it well, I put a tweet out just saying like I couldn't believe how toxic it was. Because my I was just couldn't I can't understand why it's like, you know, win a couple of games and everything's great. Ronald's brilliant and Wood and Cabango are looking brilliant and you know, we're back and the Swansea way's back and it's all brilliant. And then one bad performance and then it was you know, Ronald's rubbish, he's been found out, Wood was being slated after the game. I don't know what happened with fans and I was thinking, how how does it change that? And then obviously we win the Cardiff game and it's and it's changed again. So I just I c I can't understand this massive like up and down every week. And I just don't think I don't think it helps, but uh it seems like that's long forgotten now. Yeah. Well I watched a bit of the quite a bit of the Bristol game. Um prim- I watched all of the first half and we didn't create that many chances. Maybe that's where people are saying it was a poor game. But we, we dominated the game, really. And if you look at the stats and the momentum graph and everything that you can look at into the game, we dominated the game, right? Bristol set up in a way that they didn't mind us having the ball and maybe we couldn't rise to the challenge of being able to take advantage of, of that. Okay, And we've seen a similar theme playing this style of football for many years under many managers when that sort of style they've set up to play defensively against us, we can't break it down. And it was just the sort of perfect example of that again. Uh, just usually that happens when we are home and not away. It's unusual to see the home team going down that sort of avenue when it comes to set it up for the match. So if you look at the stats specifically, right, and I'm only saying this in detail just to kind of highlight um Maybe it was a bit of an overreaction to the negativity afterwards. Bristol had 27% of the ball at home. Like, yeah, okay, they won 1-0, and that's the one that matters. I, I completely get that. And I will always say possession for the sake of possession doesn't matter. I'm just trying to highlight that they set up a certain way here. And Luke Williams is still learning, and Luke and Swansea under Luke Williams is still learning. You're probably never expect going to expect like the home team to sit back in the way they have done here and maybe we just couldn't work that out on a given day so we had eight shots they had five we didn't get any on target massive issue there i think the clinical nature of our team right now is a problem i think that continued against cardiff and we'll discuss that later um but that's something that perhaps we can't fix until the summer but yeah so like we did really dominate this game now bristol obviously got a goal against perhaps the run of the match but that's obviously what they set up. And then when they get that one goal, they just need to defend that. They they just need to sit back even more then and defend that one one goal lead. And at home, it's probably more in their favour to be able to do it. And for them, it was a good result, you know. They're kind of fighting in the same area of us in the league. If they look at their last five games, that is the only win with the rest of them being defeats. So maybe that's why they approached the game the way they did, because they're desperate for points, you know. And I think what you could argue... I'm not trying to defend the performance against Bristol. We should have done better ultimately. Like maybe it was a blip, and obviously we learned from it for the next one, and that's what's important. But maybe you could look at the positives and say, in the fact that Bristol set up and played this way is a sign that what we are doing is going in the right direction because teams are approaching the match against us a certain way, thinking that we're going to cause issues. You know, because if you're going to if you're going to accept having twenty something percent possession at home against the team that's lower than you in the league in a relegation fight, then we must be doing something right because you'd expect that sort of mentality against the likes of Leeds or Leicester. Not against Swansea, who at the time were like four or five points off relegation. So I think that's something to highlight. Um, What I will also say is if you look at the general form, we've had four wins in our last eight, three of them, three defeats in our last eight. Two of those defeats came against Leeds and Ipswich, the other one against Bristol. And that's our last eight games sampled. The wins have come against Hull, Sunderland, Blackburn, and obviously Cardiff now, and a draw against Watford. Now, I personally thought the draw against Watford was more disappointing than the win, the, the loss against Bristol, personally, because I think that we put ourselves in a position in the first half where we should have won that game in the first half, probably should have been out of sight at half time. And for me, and these are the criticisms we've had for a while under Luke Williams, and I'm sure he will rectify it. I think some of it might come after he gets a summer to really mould the squad in the way that he wants. There's two big concerns. 
it's our lack of clean sheets that we're able to keep. So generally, and I know we kept, kept one against Cardiff, but generally we need to score two goals as a minimum to win games. And the second one is the lack of scoring in the second half. So before Cardiff game, um, we hadn't scored for eight games in the second half. Um, just falling off in general in the second half, I think we're quite dominant or have been recently in the first halves, and that includes against Watford. I think the first half against Bristol, we were better than the second half, as much as um, you know, the game you could say is quite poor overall compared to the others. Bristol got their opportunity to win the game in the second half. They didn't really do anything in the first half, as much as we weren't amazing ourselves. But um, yeah, so I think second halves and um, the clean sheets is a massive issue and at the moment for us. So I'd even take that into the win against Cardiff uh, as well when we're going to discuss that. As as much as the celebrations and the positives from that game are definitely massive and everyone needs to enjoy that result, I still think both things came through a little bit and you could still see that there. I know Cardiff didn't score, but we were definitely better in the first half than the second half. They probably had more chances in the second half to score. And we definitely should have scored more than two goals. So we should have been more clinical. Now, we did score two on this occasion and we did win the game. So kind of what I said works. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think they are the two things. And I wouldn't say I'm going to go hysterically frustrated about it after a loss like the one against Bristol and then forget everything after a win like against Cardiff. I think it's good to criticise and highlight the issues you have or maybe you can see uh, but also not get carried away then when you win games to think maybe they, they're gone because they're clearly still there. It's just a work in progress, and that's completely fine. I know I went off on a little bit of a long tangent there, Lee, but have you got anything to say on any of that? No, I think I think uh, I think you covered it all, really, and more. But uh, well, we no, kind of I, rehearsed it before the video. Yeah, <laughs> no, I no, I, I no, I agree with what you said. I think, um, I, and I think people got a bit lost when I was trying to say like I don't understand the hysterics of, of a losing one game. I wasn't defending that performance at all. I did, I'm not saying it was good enough, but like you said, you've got to have a bit of a level criticism. Like you know, don't you you don't get too carried away when we had a bad performance like that. And equally, it's not, you know, we're not worthy because <clears throat> for, uh, for for beating Cardiff, even though you know it was a it was a cracking win and we love that. But um, I think, yeah. but oh, but uh, but honestly, I think I think Luke Williams is doing the right thing. Like you said, I think what I've seen the the progress already under him. I think there's there's been. There has been good progress in the short time he's been here. Now there are there are things you need to work on, like you said. Like we, we spoke about, like defensively, we've been we've been poor and we can see some poor goals, and we're not clinical enough. I think that Watford game was per, was the perfect one. I, I can't remember us having so many chances and not winning a game. We absolutely dominated. So that was that's two drop points in that one. But I think you're right. I think if we can, you know, we continue to improve with him under this season. Uh, which I think they will, and then he can get, you know, he can get the players that fit what he wants in the summer, even if it's just you know one or two just additions um, in key areas, particularly up front. That I would say we're not clinical enough, but I think, you know, we'll 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 come on to it. But I think the players we got at the moment is just you know, it's not the answer. We're not going to get the goals that we need um, at, at the top end of the field. So yeah, I get I get what you're saying. There are and, and maybe it's an issue of. Um, fitness as well that we dive off in the second half I think you know he's asking to play this high press I think we saw that like in abundance in the Cardiff game and maybe it wasn't so much of an issue in that game because of the adrenaline and the occasion maybe you you know you get an extra you know you get an extra boost off from the players when you know the atmosphere was that good and you know it's such a big game but maybe that is it he's asking players to do this high press um Maybe you know they're fading a bit in the second half, but again, all things that I think will get ironed out in the summer. So what I'm seeing so far, I'm just I'm I, I am I am impressed. I got to be honest. Yeah, no, I think he's going in the right. Look, he's, he's take he made the decision to get stuck in and change the way we're playing halfway through a season in a relegation battle with a run of fixtures against the top teams in the division. So it's a really difficult task. So you can never forget. It's a big the call. context around what he's doing. It's a big decision. Could have gone wrong. If we got relegated and it's gone wrong, does he then have the co- like? The, has he got the confidence in the board and the, the fans to continue doing what he's doing in the lower league? I think that's a really different story and conversation, yeah. and that would be interesting. But I haven't got to that point. It doesn't look like it's going to. To be fair, now I think we're kind of, I think we've pulled ourselves out 
of the relegation fight, personally. I know, technically, we're Famous still... Last words. No, but I think... No, I think... I think you can I see think... us trending up. Touch definitely. wood, yeah. I think the... Um... The, the, the points difference, I mean, like, you look and you think, like, what is it now? It's seven points from the drop. And you think, oh, you know, yeah. seven points is not good. But there's, a, there's so much traffic between us and the drop. If you've got to look at about... points per game as well in that, like, yeah, eight-game you... sample I just highlighted. Yeah. And you're talking about, what, six or seven teams that would all have to win, you know? A lot it's of not matches. just seven points. They would yeah. all have to win a lot of matches. I think you're right. And we play a lot of them. And we play a lot of them. But I think but I think a lot of the... But I think, you know, looking at our points total, uh, I was looking at the other day, I think... The highest team that got relegated, you know, the highest points total of a team that got relegated was 54, which was ridiculous. And we're on 46. So, I mean, you know, we're only talking, what, eight more points? I don't think it's going to be that from eight high games. This time. No, and it's not going to be that high. I think another two wins is probably enough anyway. But, and like you said, we're trending in the right direction. Like going back to like what you were saying about Luke Williams, and it, like I think when he first took over, you know, it was a bit edgy wasn't it i mean we you know we had criticisms we thought oh you know you know this is looking a bit but i think all yeah. those things that we've talked about i think they they're all getting better and they will they that's, will that's what you want to see like we use yeah, exactly what, see, what we see on the football pitch like we're a podcast yeah everything we say is our opinion <clears throat> we're not football analysts we're just two fans who want to chat about our club and football and we want to get involved with the people who watch us and chat to all you a lot as well about your opinions and nobody's definitively right or wrong it's just it's just opinion based and when we do highlight criticisms and stuff that we see that we think should be better or improved or it's, it's always like you'll always get stuff that you want better you're in championship we're in the bottom half the championship so you're down here there's going to be stuff you want better you always want to win more games you always want to lose less or draw less games you know like you're always going to be in that boat in football. That's it's a sport, you know. It's competitive. Every team wants to win, and there's always two teams on the pitch. So there's always going to be stuff you could talk about doing better. And I think just because you've highlighted criticisms, like I highlighted these things and concerns about our defending quite a lot in his early part of uh, the tenure, and I kind of that's carried over now. What I'm saying is more about keeping clean sheets. We're not really getting pumped anymore. But I'm not confident that we keep clean sheets. We've always got one goal conceded in us. So that's progress, isn't it? So like you concede in four against Leeds, and I'm really concerned about the high line. Now I'm just concerned that we can't keep a clean sheet and we're always leaking one goal, you know? And can we score enough the other end then to win a game? So that's progress. So like I am highlighting concerns that I have and I would like Luke Williams to address, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna go throw my toys out of the pram and start on a tantrum because it's like really bad all the time and they're not so and it's like, it takes time it's work in progress you know you might need new players in you might need a summer to work with them you might need a season to work with them to improve them stuff will take a while and he's obviously putting his ideas across and you can see it visibly on the pitch that stuff is changing stuff is improving stuff is getting better week after week i think i said after the run of fixtures against the top teams i was like look Fair enough, you're against the top teams. So some of the issues that have been present presented there, you know, like you could argue, okay, fair, you're against the top teams. So now put your money where your mouth is. Now you get against more winnable uh, opponents. Let's let's see what you have actually done to make a difference and see where we are as a team. And ultimately, we've been picking up wins and getting results. And even a draw against Watford, I said I was disappointed, but it's a draw away. And really, if you're if you draw away. That's, that's a good sign. If you can win your own games and draw your away games, that's a good foundation for a good season. Um, so as much as we probably should have won that game, you can't really be too disgruntled no, at a draw a, either. That's a sign of progress, isn't it? That we're yeah, yeah. With the draw away at Watford, uh, <clears> you know, <throat> even in the situation they're in, it's, uh, you know, where their manager's been sacked now as well, hasn't he? But I mean, it's still a hard... Getting yeah. anything away in the Championship was good, but they played so well in that game, they just didn't finish the chances. And that's what... And that's what I've been really impressed to see. I think players have come into their own as well. Like, you know, we spoke about Ronald and Plaquetta as well, or Plaquetta, whatever you say his name. I think he's been great. But what yeah. you get, what we're getting I know how to say his name, right? But you know when you put me on the spot like this, like when you've said it and you're corrected, now I'm immediately second. You're over, you're so overthinking, you're my, way overthinking. My manager in work is Polish and he has literally given me a lesson on how to say his name. And now I'm already nervous about pronouncing it because... Go on. <laughs> no, I can't. I definitely can't say his first name. Have you heard his first name properly said? Yeah, I, I, I just I can't work. I can't even process 
the way of speaking his first name. It's yeah, difficult to be fair. Nah. It's difficult. I always say Plajeta. Plajeta. Yeah. That's how, yeah. That sounds, yeah. sounds Plajeta. Plajeta. You've got to like, <laughs> apparently, with the, like, the Welsh tinge. I know it's not Welsh, but that's the best way it got described to me. So. Oh, where do we go? Maybe, you know, we can. I can't, I can't do the there. first name. It, it's like a silent P as well. Like, I don't, I don't get it. It's weird. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's not weird. It's not weird. That's a bit harsh. It's not weird. It's just different different culture and language, isn't it? But I can't get to grips with it. I'm not going to keep trying because I keep making a fool of uh, myself. Try, try to dig then. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but anyway, you know, I think I think he's been I think he's been great. I think, uh, but what we're getting is I think we're having like pockets of good performances as well. Like I think, you know, it's like Plajeta has like a good game here and then maybe he's quieter in another game and the same with Ronald and then we're just waiting for that. I guess you could argue it kind of came against Cardiff, but I think we're just waiting for that one performance where it all comes together. Because I, I, I say as well, I think Wood and Cabango, I know Cabango's been injured, but they had that spell of games where I thought they played really well with the ball of their feet as well. I think that they kind of came into their own there. Um, yeah, we could do kind of drop off in the second half. Um, but, you know, there's there's been po- real good pockets of good performances. Norton and Allen coming back into fitness has been a big thing as well. Those two getting fit again and playing like uh, playing like their old best, really. But um, I'm quite excited under Williams. I think we're seeing progress. And uh, Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned the two wingers there and pockets of performance. It's going back to the Bristol game. If they set up in such a way of being packed at the back... It's not really a surprise that we didn't see the best out of them when they didn't have the space to run into, which is where we've seen them excel when they've got clean space, a bit of ground. They're attacking maybe one player with with space either side to do something, use their pace, you know. Bristol sat back and didn't allow that. It's not really a surprise that we didn't necessarily see them both excel. So it kind of goes hand in hand and makes a bit of sense. And then it's on us to maybe work a different way out of beating that sort of opposition and that's fine we just probably haven't got there yet because we're trying to still work out the first way so when the first way is nullified okay maybe it's a bit disappointing and that's something to think about going forward i'm sure you will and i guess it's the whole like have a plan b and stuff but i think luke williams is still trying to get plan a working at the moment and i'm not ready to start criticizing he hasn't got a plan b just yet i think i'll probably leave that until next season if plan a stops working because i think um plan a is difficult to get right and we won't see plan a at its best i think until at least after the summer as well yeah um, that's fair. but i think we're, but i think again going on to that plan a is kind of you know kind of works but then i don't think we have we don't have much in terms of personnel either to implement another, no. another you know, we, and that's another reason why we kind of dip off in the second half because I think, you know, the what players that are coming on are edge. not really replacing the same positions quite often no. either, are they? No, exactly. It's like you're taking off the wingers and we haven't seen much of Sago Jr., but like you've got Oli Cooper or Patino coming on, going onto the wing, yeah, sometimes Cullen, all, and they just, they're not the same as, as a Ronald, are they? Like they're not doing the same thing at all. As no, those players, so they're offering. We're now a different way of attacking, and you're right. Like I think, not that saying that any of them players are bad, but there's no like for like replacement. So if that fundamentally changes the makeup of the squad, and if you look at our early season, and we were saying we needed pace and we needed a bit of width and wingers and stuff, and the players coming on to replace that don't have that. You go back to that same situation of, well, we need this. We need you know it's not there again. So um. Having said that, I think Ollie Cooper came on against Cardiff and had a good game, but we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Yeah, I think as, as well, though, like, you know, we know how big the Cardiff game is. It's massive. Like, we, we, you know, people start talking about it when it's three, four weeks away. So, yeah, you know, do you have one eye on that game, you know, you know, subconsciously? I'm not saying the players take their foot off the yeah, gas. And they go, maybe they didn't but we know how big against it is. Bristol. We know, how big, we know how big it is. And I think even, like, when Luke Williams takes over, the people, you know, he gets the question, like, you know, oh, you know, we Cardiff can't do the double over us, especially that they've beaten us in the first game. All eyes were on that second game. It was massive. We saw how big it was when we were watching the game. It was absolutely huge. So with that maybe looming six days later, because we played on the Sunday, um, I don't know, maybe. The performance was poor. Anyway. There's no there's no, uh, yeah. there's no, no excuse but... for it, but I'm just saying, like, I, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to have that horrendous performance. I would have lost 5-0 against Bristol City to have that 
win on Saturday yeah. against Cardiff. I'd have taken that all day. All of that section was basically to say it's not the end of the world when we lose to Bristol and stuff like proper having a massive tantrum on Twitter about the fact that it was an awful performance and all of a sudden it's not good enough and everything needs to change. I think that's a little bit of an overreaction and that's what we're trying to say. It's not necessary. You could criticise the stuff and he's criticising as we have done. And then you go to the Cardiff game and the same people then are like, oh my God, it's the best thing ever. And we're just trying to say, hang on now. Like last week you were saying, let's get rid of all the team. It's the end of the world. It's not good enough. And now them same players are going to be Cardiff. It's like, oh my God, get a more like a statue. Um, yeah, that's why I was saying the consistency of like for me, as much as we won against Cardiff, I would still say we weren't clinical enough and we didn't have a good enough second half. Same things I would have said about the two previous games, which we didn't win, except in those two games, they were probably the reasons we didn't win. Whereas in this one, we still managed to win, even though there was still an issue. Like that's 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 the difference on the most basic way I can put it. And yeah, the derby does add an extra layer of, um, I guess, different aspects and like it's a different match altogether. But I'm just being consistently level-headed in the way that we're performing on the pitch, no, no matter what the result is necessarily. Looking at the bigger picture, and I think the people are like doom and gloom here, ecstatic there. Like maybe just calm down a bit. That's all. <laughs> Don't yeah. need to calm down when you beat your rival. I just mean like it's not always the end of the world then when you've lost the game before. Or if we go and lose now to Sheffield Wednesday in the next game, for example. Like it doesn't need to go back to like, oh my God, we're gonna get relegated. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to say in that tweet. I just I've never I've never but I've never known I guess like you know, people can argue that's that's football fans. Well, what was the tweet again for context of those who might not have seen oh, it? I can't remember what I'll it was. It, I would try to rant a bit, but it was something like, Oh, I've ne- I've never seen it so toxic just because oh, yeah, um, yeah. it was something like that. Um I don't know if toxic was the right word to be honest, but that was the point I was trying to get across. No, it does get it. quite toxic when we lose though, doesn't it? From starts arguing that's, with each other. That's what I mean. I guess like... you can argue that like football fans are like that in general. Like, yeah, that's that's fair enough. Football fans are fickle, you know, you lose you lose and people are gutted and that's fine, and then you win, and people are ecstatic. That's why I do it myself. Again, I said we never do podcasts straight after a game because I know that I'm sometimes really negative when we lose and overhyped when we win. But then I just couldn't believe it when I opened Twitter after that Bristol City game. You'd swear we were like bottom of the table, lost eight in a row. Um, that that's the level of like criticism I think it was getting. <clears throat> yeah. This is the tweet, just for those who haven't seen it, and I guess where all of that conversation for the last 20 minutes or so came from. Never known our fan base to be this toxic. Feeling around the club is horrendous at the moment. Can only hope we generate a good atmosphere for next week. Obviously, this is after the Bristol game, so ahead of Cardiff. Would Cabango and Ronald have been been great in the last few weeks? One bad game in a few weeks and everyone is ready to ship them off. Where's the middle ground? And I think that's a fair comment. And it comes back to what we were saying. It's fine to criticise performance against Bristol. But, you know, sometimes it's just one match. Like, don't get overcarried away that somebody's had a bad game. It was like, I don't know, just I feel like everyone's a bit over the top sometimes on social medias. And as much as you can say, step away from it. We're trying to run a podcast and share our stuff. So we kind of got our page, don't we? So, so we like to try and communicate and have conversations. Just sometimes you get... Not the best stuff, but I think some people have some good chats on the on the comments. Oh yeah, that no, one. No, that's that's what we want though. We want to just have a conversation, yeah. really. And that <clears> was, not saying, uh... I'm not saying everyone is in that category. There's there's a no, few no, minority nice who are quite have, loud. Yeah. It's nice to have nice to have a conversation. That's why we do it. I mean, that's the, that's the whole reason we do it. Oh, actually, I yeah. did. I've speaking of that and having a conversation because we haven't done it for so long. It was one of the home games. I think it might have been Blackburn or maybe before that. Um, there was an elderly gentleman that came up to me and said he really enjoyed the podcast and. We were doing really well, so I like appreciate that massively. If anyone, you know, is listening and just wants to say hello, um, yeah, if you ever there. see us, just come and say hello. We'll be happy. I mean, if, if 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 you do disagree with us, don't you know? Don't come and shout at us. Maybe we'll just you know, look. We'll have a pint. Loads, and a chat. loads of people. I'm sure loads of people disagree with us, and that's fine. Just yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Have a chat but that's why we like to have a chat. It's I disagree. Opinions, I, dis- isn't it? I disagree with my friends all the time when we're sat in the pub talking about talking about the football. You should see our WhatsApp group sometimes when the Swans are not playing very well. Yeah. During the game, <laughs> yeah. like usually it's you. Usually it's you that's a bit like, oh my god, this is horrendous. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, getting relegated, me. and I'm there, like, well, okay, there's some good signs. Like, this is alright. This is alright. Like, whatever. And then 
after Luke Williams took charge, it was kind of the other way around, wasn't it? Where I was like, we can't yeah. defend, this is awful. And then you were like, yeah, but you know, they're doing this a bit better. And it's just one of it's just emotion in it and it's opinion. And that's what football gives you. That's why everyone loves football, because you could chat about it until well, again, day, that, really, that's, and... that's what it is, isn't it? I guess like a lot of people, if you're if you're just straight on your phone after the game, like I said, the stuff that comes up of, yeah. of us two in like, on WhatsApp after games, we're not, never yeah. never we're not always it. right. We're not always right. No, like, of course not. God, I've had some bad takes. It's also very, you know, like anyone's welcome to put the camera on and tell us your opinions too. If you just like, if people really disagree with us, like it's not, it's not easy to chuck the camera on and have a chat. But yeah, we but appreciate that's why, everyone. That, um, yeah, that's that's why that's why it's good though. I mean, like I've had, I'm not arguments, but I've had uh, heated conversations with like my own father about the Swans. Yeah. We have like completely two different opinions, but. Uh, you know, so it is. That's why we love it. Anyway, I don't know if you can hear. Is there any screaming in the background? I just need to ask. No, I can't hear screaming. Okay, that's good because one of, one of the uh, well, the the eldest of the two is having a bit of a meltdown. I'm just concerned it's going to be travelling through the microphone. Um, it's just it's just a window of what the last couple of weeks has been like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I probably should be helping, but I've been given an hour to. <laughs> To come and discuss the game. So, so if we, uh, so if we like, if we keep the podcast going for like another hour and a half, <laughs> then you can have a bit of a rest. Yeah. Sorry, um, sorry uh, to your partner if she's listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay, so let's detail talk about the Cardiff game. Then we did promises. Probably wanted to get this sooner, but whatever. I've been here for a while. There's a lot to discuss. Um, massive performance. Massive win. You were there. I unfortunately had other goings on. I wasn't <laughs> able to go down. Wouldn't have been well. I mean, maybe it was a good omen to be honest. The um, the birth happened before that game and after the one before. And uh, put it this way: when I've I've got two kids now, and both of them won their first derby. So I'm not saying go. I'm not saying this for me, but you know, I know I'm not. It's it's not happening every time either. Just just put that out there. <laughs> yeah, come on, get ready for next season though. <laughs> get going again. Not happening. Maybe you oh, should do it. I was gonna say your turn. It'd be my yeah. turn next. Yeah. It's like, uh, oh, we've lost it's like, oh, we lost the last one. I was like, all right, that's it. We need uh, we need to correct this. All right, come on, <laughs> let's just have a let's have a kid. Or maybe if someone wants to step up next time, that's fine. Um but yeah, um so the, maybe describe first of all, because I know you obviously go back to that tweet, you asked for a good atmosphere for this game. How was the atmosphere there when you were there? Yeah, I like, like I gotta be honest. I don't think uh, I I don't think many people will disagree with me. I think it was one of the best atmospheres ever at the, at the stadium that I can remember. Um, better than a lot of derbies that have been in the last couple of years as well. Like, it just seems to go up a level. I think that that one meant a lot more than maybe the other ones because obviously they'd beaten us earlier on in the season. Um, We'd had a bit of a rough, you know. I, I wouldn't say we've had a really rough season. It sound we make it sound like we've had turmoil, but you know we haven't had the best of seasons. Wasn't there um, a stat that we were like same points last as last yeah, year, like the week yeah. ago? But I think just a lot of a lot of goings on, a lot of you know, a lot of bad results, a lot of bad feeling. You know, managers coming and going, not knowing who's coming in. You know, inconsistency anyway, on the pitch and behind the scenes. Yeah, just just a lot going on this season. So I think that one probably meant more than any others in the last couple of years. I think it was a really, and you could feel that like instantly the atmosphere was brilliant. My worry was going into that game that a lot of home games this year, the atmosphere has been quite, again, I, I use the word toxic, but it's been quite, you know, tense where, you know, where you have a bad performance and you can just feel the crowd getting on the players back more so than they have done um, in the last like sort of 10, 15 years, really. So, and then after I saw the, you know the outcry after the Bristol City game. My worry was, oh my God, if we go like one nil down against Cardiff, like early on, my worry was that it was just going to be really bad. That that was that was just a worry based on what I'd what I'd seen. But I, I couldn't have been more wrong because I, I genuinely think it was one of the best atmospheres in the stadium I I'd experienced for years. And I think a lot of people said about the like the low goal comparing it to Prattley's late goal against Forest. And I think I think it was up there. That the stadium was absolutely rocket. It was best I've seen it for ages. Yeah, 
<clears throat> Good unit coming through on the on the television as well. I can uh, can say that, and um, I was quite nervous going into the game. To be yeah, honest, yeah. I I just didn't know what to think because, you know, they the Cardiff have been in good form going into this game as much as perhaps people don't want to admit it. They won four games in a row, and they've just been Ipswich with two late goals. Um, so yeah, difficult one to kind of go into feeling any sort of confidence. I, I had confidence that Luke Williams was going to get him up for it, and. To be fair, and I've seen a lot. We've seen a lot since about how he did that, and I think fair play. People criticised a lot Michael Duff about how he reacted to the derby earlier this season, and I think it was a contrast on how to get your team up for it and how to relay the importance. Now, you got a fan in, didn't he, to kind of do a bit of a pre-match, and yeah. um, <clears throat> Liam Cullen mentioned in his interview after the match how he was one of the best pre-match team talks he's ever heard or one of the most motivating or like um like fired him up for the match and we started like 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 one probably one of the best starts i've seen us have all season come up the blocks flying i was i thought we were going to get an early goal the way we started uh, a couple of close chances harry darling at the crossbar didn't he as well yep cost me 55 quid bet I think, but... <laughs> Not better at all. Um, <clears throat> put a bet builder on quid. Harry Darling score. Joe Allen yellow card, and he hit the he hit the bar, and then Joe Allen got a card within like five minutes or something. So I was a bit like, oh, that was been easiest money ever. But, um, yeah, well, nearly came in, whisker away. Yeah. But yeah, so I think we smashed the first half. But I was always concerned going through. I know Liam Cullen obviously scored, and it was a very good goal. Um, People said Ronald had an off day, maybe against Bristol, but I think he was electric against Cardiff. He does some really good work for the gun. He didn't get the assist, but running up the wing, really good work. Obviously, Norton gets the assist in the end, so really good ball. Spot Cullen, far post, um, clean in space. And obviously, I, I thought his finish was a bit scruffy, but it doesn't matter. It went in. It was a, yeah, I thought it was it was a scruffy. It was difficult, though, wasn't it? Like, it was yeah, it was, look, I'm, it was I'm not awkward. criticizing Cullen at all. No, it's just, it just... Um, I'm one of them that another day he probably doesn't get close to scoring, so it was a difficult one to control and put in. He kind of hits it in the shin. Yeah, he so kind of overruns it, him. doesn't he? And then he's yeah. like in the air Backtrack and, and shins yeah. it in. But um, I know there's a lot of calls for a foul on Perry NG, Cardiff's wonder defender, wonder boy at the yeah. back. Um, I think Ooh. there was nothing in it to be honest, but I know that's probably biased. Like everyone wearing blue probably thought it was a foul, including the manager who spoke about it in the post match and everyone in white or oh, and the referee didn't think it was a foul so yeah i think it was soft wasn't it i, just, I don't think to be honest i didn't really notice until after i didn't really know why they had the, i thought they were calling for offside because he came in late to the back didn't he and he was like completely on his own i thought oh maybe he's offside yeah? and that's why they were complaining um and then when i looked it back i just thought oh, it's a bit soft like, yeah. was he I think, got there I think, anyway yeah but I, I but i think that's what it is i think he's not getting there and he just has the contact and thinks, oh, I'm going to go down and try and buy a foul. Yeah, so like, get in there. The manager saying, oh, it's a foul, a goal shouldn't have been given. But like, what? So like, if, if he wasn't fouled and he scored, then the goal would have stood. Yeah, like he wouldn't have got there. Like, I don't think he would have yeah. got there, would he? No, I don't think he's getting there. And I think that's what it is. I think like he sees, he sees he's not getting there. He's out of position. It's an excuse uh, then, and he it? just goes down, yeah, to try and get a foul. I think, and then you know, everybody throws their arms up, and sometimes, sometimes you do get them. Um, but I don't think you can then complain afterwards. Uh, um, oh, you know, it's, it's a bad decision, especially after some of the other decisions that the, the ref missed or let go. There's a couple of other opportunities in the first half. I think we had quite a lot. Cardiff didn't really lay a glove. It's not I the think... first time we've seen that this season, but they haven't laid, didn't lay a glove on us in the first half. Mac Rhymes had a volley. I would have. Oh, yeah. It was quite early on, that was, wasn't it? I would have loved if that went in. It was so. I think that goal, I know Cullen's goal was quite scruffy. It was so important to be got that goal, though, for the dominance we had. And that yeah, was. We needed a goal in the first half. This is what I was saying at the time. I was like, I'm a bit worried the longer this goes on. Yeah, I was worried as because well. Because of the thought... reasons I've discussed at length yeah, already. Same. You know, and you know what it's like. You've watched enough Swans games where we dominate and we don't score. And then. And and it did it did happen because I remember saying to my dad who sits next to me, um, first like 10, 15 minutes, I was like, we are absolutely dominant here. We have to score. And then 
after we didn't score for the first 15 20 minutes not that the not that the atmosphere dipped but the game kind of settled down a little bit there was a spell where you know the game just kind of calmed down a little bit it wasn't so like pure passion it was just like right we're into the game now and i thought oh no i hope like you know cardiff haven't settled down here but then, i think might mighty got in once didn't he but he didn't really do anything with his chance yeah i gotta I be honest i i know like Ma- mighty i don't know how to say his name yeah mighty is it i think mighty, they, they, they had um to be honest they didn't have they didn't have many chances did they Really. No, he he got in once. I think Harry Darling did a bit of an error, and then he had to come back and win the ball back or something. Yeah, I remember yeah. messaging Didn't you at the it. time, being like, yeah. "I've said this for ages, and I'll say it again." Harry Darling is an enigma. He's so good going forward and a threat, but he's always got that in him where you just give the ball away randomly in a stupid place, which he did. He's running through the back and just plays it to to the Cardiff guy, and he threw, and he was in the box, I think, and. Um, Darling covers well, to be fair, to, to bring her back. But I think his teammates were a bit frustrated that he didn't maybe cross it along the box. Yeah. Probably their best sniffer goal. They didn't really do much with it, though. So that's why I say they didn't really lay a glove. But speaking of Darling and um, Mete, they yeah. had a little bit of a interaction themselves. I don't know how he's not got a red card for, for what he did. So those who might not have seen Mete and Darling had a clash to get up. And Mete kind of, you know, they do that thing where you get up off the floor and you're annoyed at someone. So you're like very slowly and not forcefully knock your head into the opposition. I don't want to say headbutt because it wasn't really a headbutt, but no, it was forward wasn't, movement with the head, with contact with the other person's head. And ultimately, that's a red card in football. I've seen it plenty of times. Yeah. Yeah. And the... it's, it's like, it's really like, daft isn't it and really soft but i think it is it's, it's, it's more of a it's not the threat of it is it it's more the like um to avoid any repercussions of that sort of boiling over yeah, yeah. i think that's why usually any sort of contact like that is is deemed a red what's the word what's what do they call it when you argue like with the ref descent yeah, that's it. So it would be classed as dissent more than like, oof. yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? That's what they would class it as, not foul yeah, but play. I think, or... Yeah, I think the idea is as well. Like, you move your head towards someone. Like, where do you draw the line? Yeah. Like, you know, oh, that like that one's not a red. But then, you know, what's the what's the force and the distance of moving? I'll your do head a bit harder someone? next time. Yeah. I, like, like, so next up. time I do a bit of head. Yeah. So I think soft as it is, because I think you're right. They're just head to head, and he. Just kind of moves his head, just taps his head like that, and he like. But like, yeah, like you said, over the years, years obviously and, listening, but yeah. yeah, years and years and years of watching football, uh, that's a red card, isn't it? As silly as it is, yeah. it is it's a red card. It should have been, yeah, should have been a red. <clears throat> Look, Darling went down like like, yeah, yeah. anything. He went down like he just got a punch from Mike Tyson. I got to um, I got to be honest, right? I don't know if you might disagree with me, but I couldn't see it where I was sitting. It was the other side of the pitch, but I couldn't see like what happened before but when darling went down in that manner i thought oh he's trying to buy a red yeah so maybe that went against him a little bit i don't know i thought yeah probably did and look we probably was who was it that did it um last season with callum robinson was Cabango, it darling it? cabango yeah it was kind off. of yeah and it's quite similar i feel like cabango did buy that red a little bit maybe with well, he threw the ball at him yeah, no, I know. I know. I'm not saying it wasn't a red card, but like, does the no, reaction I, I, call for no, it? No, I think Cabango, like, um, I, he, he didn't really react to that one. He just kind of just like was so shocked that they the threw the ball at his head. He was like, "Well, wh- why have you done that?" But I, like, with the Darling one, I think the overreaction probably didn't help because my thought oh, was, yeah. "Ah, he's trying to buy it." That's I might exactly be thinking of, I might it. be thinking of another one. But there's you, Ryan Manning used to do it all the time, didn't he? To be fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, you are you are right. They both got a yellow card, which is obviously why he's saying it didn't go in his favour. So Matey didn't get sent off. Probably could have in another game on another day. I don't think the ref maybe saw the entire thing. I think the linesman yeah, had to maybe. say what he saw. And I think because perhaps he was unsure about what happened and then Darlin's reaction, because he literally went around rolling, crying around yeah, on the floor. Yeah. And obviously that frustrated the Cardiff players more and it turned into a bit of a like, well, hang on, that's a bit of a dramatic reaction. 
yeah. think the safe thing to do for the ref in his eyes was to book them both. But on another day, that could have been a red. And to be fair, I've seen plenty of Cardiff fans saying he was an idiot and he could have. Seen oh, it was it was silly, day. like because he should he should have gone anyway. I mean, if the ref, I think if the ref sees it or if he has like VAR and sees that back, he, he goes and he yeah. just <clears throat> it's gone. Even even Carl the Dragon on TikTok said that it should have been a red card. So. There we go. Well, that's, that's all you need to know. <laughs> Have you seen his video outside the Liberty Stadium the other day? Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Even the funny. world's biggest Cardiff fan <laughs> thinks it was a red. Yeah, he, he, he cracks me up, i got to say. Uh, if you don't know who Cal the Dragon is, um, just Google him. <laughs> that's all I can say. I sh- you, you'll find out. You'll find out. Um, yeah. There's a top, top league called the Garden League that that he runs and operates. So, yeah, you can go and discover a world that you never knew existed. Um, anyway, back to this game. And that wasn't the first time he probably should have got a red, though. I haven't got a yellow card for that. Later on, right before half time, he commits a cynical foul. I, I can't remember which player it was, but he. Oh, yeah. Someone's broken free. I think Cardiff had a corner or something like that. And we're breaking on the counter. I don't know if it was a corner or something. We were breaking on the counter, essentially. Player gets past him, and he, he pulls him back. You know, you see a yellow card for that any day of the week. Player's done you, and you just pull him back to the floor. Cynical foul. That's always a yellow card, and the referee didn't book him. He gave him another chance, if you like. Lenient, if you ask me. Considering the first one, potentially could have been a red. I don't... If he's not on a yellow card already, he probably gets a yellow card for that. Oh, he hundred percent gets it. He so why doesn't he get? A, a why doesn't he get a second yellow then? Because well, of the like, nature I think, of the game. Yeah, I think I think the ref doesn't want to give the red. He's, he's like he's really trying not to give a red card in the game. I think. Um, we had he doesn't want to have to make that, that exact thing. I believe it was. Um, yeah, we did. But Joe yeah, Allen had been I booked for a really was, soft. Then. Joe like, Allen got, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, he got I think actually like it was Joe Allen, maybe. It might have been, but he got booked for like a like a challenge that was like a little bit late, which was a bit on the cusp of, you know, maybe being a yellow. I think it was a little bit harsh to be a yellow. So if that was the level he was set in, that one was 100% a yellow. So there's like two red cards he missed, really. Twice he should yeah. have been sent off. I correct myself. We didn't get one in the second half for one. We did have a challenge. Like I thought I got booked, but it didn't. Uh, I'm surprised. Maybe there were other. We can't say the ref wasn't consistent then, because I know we definitely had. I think it was Tymon. Um, he pulled someone back, and like he often does. To be fair, and yeah, yeah, he didn't get he a yellow. One. To be fair, so I, the ref was consistent. I would say, but another ref and another day. I think definitely books for that sort of challenge. Joe Allen's one. No, I think I think it probably was a yellow card. I don't know. It was. I think Do I'm sure think? it was like I'm sure it was he like smashed in. I'm sure it was like our first foul. He's just like a little bit late. I don't know if it was. Yeah, yeah, it was. Doesn't but like I understand what you're saying. It was our first foul. He was a little bit late, but he was late and he went through the player. I haven't seen it again on TV. To be fair, I'm going off what I saw at the time. He smashed him. He, it was it was a good like get the crowd going, take a yellow card ah, from right, the team okay. tackled. Fair. Do you know what I mean? Like on the TV, yeah. you were like, yeah, it's definitely yellow. But I pumped the crowd up. Do you know what I mean? And you want some of that on the derby. To be fair. So I think it was a fair yellow card. I, I fair, definitely think it fair was. Enough, fair enough, fair um, enough. Yeah, so Harry Darling in the first half as well had a chance at the crossbar. I think I've already mentioned that one. He had a couple of chances though with headers. He definitely should score more goals from headers, Harry Darling. Yeah, he should, to be fair. He's like, he's so good in the air. I mean, how many, how many times we've been, I think how many times we've been away and... Uh, he goes up for a corner, and we're just like, he's going to win the first header. Yeah, he's, he does he's every t- literally every time he wins the header every time. I think that he he's very close to being a clinical set piece player. He's not one of them defenders that wins the balls all the time. He's got a fifty pence head. He's not that. He's really good at winning the ball, and he's really good at putting it on target, but he's not good at directing it. Like where he wants, do you know what I mean? So quite often, by putting it on target, he's just in a straight to the keeper or something like that. Like you had the crossbar this time. Yeah, the other think... chances he had went straight out, straight at the keeper. I don't think he's the best at like getting power and then putting it into like a corner or something, you know. And if he can get, if he can find that part of his head in game, 
he's going to score a lot more goals. I think that's the only part of it he's missing because he causes mayhem. He wins a lot of them. So if he can just find that little bit of extra like way of diverting it left or right to where he would normally be putting it, I think he, he could definitely get yeah, a few he more. He scored three, I think, this season. So it's Yeah, I mean, he does have a good return for center off. I think you could see why he scored. I think he scored like 10 goals and he for MK Dons from center off. So like it's, it's a mad return for a defender. And you can see why now, because I think if he gets... I think he's been unlucky in some as well. Like He's hit the bar a couple of times and I think... Yeah, like but some that's of them, what I like mean. The keeper's pulled off a save, and he's missing I know, that I know you mean. liked bit of accuracy. That's the yeah, difference of having double yeah. the amount of goals. And, he's and got. again, I think um, it seems to happen in like pockets. I think because he's, he's, he seems like over the last couple of weeks he's been in and out of the team. Like I think because Wood and Cabango like played well, and Norton's come back. He hasn't played much, and then he comes back in for a little bit, and then maybe he picks up a knock, and then he's back in. If he gets that like a good run in the team, I think. Um, that's probably something you'll see happen more often. But yeah, he's he's brilliant. Yeah, he's so he's, he causes carnage. <clears throat> While we're on him, does he? If Caban goes back fit, what do you do? I think he deserves to remain in in the place at the moment. I think as good as Cabango has been, you don't get that same threat from set pieces as consistently. No, I think you're right. <laughs> Excuse me. Tired. Oh, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's been a long old time, isn't it? I think uh, last couple of weeks, but. Uh, yeah, no, I think I think you're right. I think, um, yeah, I think you can't drop him after that performance. I think he's been. I don't think you can drop anyone really after that performance. You've got to keep the confidence going, even if Cabango is fit. But with Darling, I think we should probably we should give him massive credit because he's becoming a bit of a derby like hero, really, isn't he? He always has a really good performance in the derby. Like he's always well up for it. And again yeah. on on Saturday, he was brilliant. He was so up for it, and I thought he had a great game. I know he did. We did make that one mistake, but. I think on the whole, he was brilliant. They were trying to wind him up after the yellow cards. And as much as I would say maybe working a little bit, I do feel like he was able to control it and use it to his advantage as well. Yeah. And was equally, if not more, winding them up. Um, he was being a bit of a pantomime villain. And that's something we lost when we lost Ryan Manning. And I feel like he can step into that role if it's needed um, in certain games where he can just cause a little bit of drama and. Yeah, yeah, he's done it a couple annoying. of times. Got a couple of times against Cardiff. I think it was in last year where he just he came out and absolutely smashed someone, took man and ball though. It wasn't even a foul, it was a brilliant tackle. Um yeah. I can't remember which one. It was one of the home games. Might have been the home game last year. But he just came out and absolutely perfect tackle, man and ball, smash someone. He just he reminds me a bit of um not the same sort of player, but you know, like the Alan Tate type figure where I remember there was this like you used to say before. When Tate was kind of coming to the end, he's like, I'll play him in two games all season, Cardiff home and away. Yeah. Um, um, not that it's yeah. like that, but he's becoming a bit of a, you know, a good player to have in those type of games. I think he's he's having a really good season, really, considering yeah. the um, context of the season so far. He's probably one of the stand-up performers. Anyway, moving on to second half. Perry NG again in the headlines. The winger swap sides. I haven't seen him doing that so much. Is this something he does regular? I don't know, second yeah. I, I don't know. I haven't seen I've not before. noticed. I, I thought it was a bit interesting. But it seemed to work quite well because Perry NG maybe he wasn't expecting to come back out second half and face against Ronald after um, Ronald was on the opposite wing in the first half. And he could, he could not deal with him for the first 15 minutes or so to 15 20 minutes a couple of um times he got past he brought him down and he brought him down once in the box now question because i think it is a foul it definitely is a foul so he brings ronald down ronald passes him and he grabs him enough uh he's holding him and he's holding him until ronald goes down basically he definitely starts dragging him back outside the box by the time ronald goes down he's inside the box i just I just want clarity, maybe, uh, of what the rule is, if you know. Because I was talking, I've got a Cardiff fan who I work with, and he was saying he thought that they go back to where the foul began. And I said, I wasn't sure if it's a case of it's an ongoing foul. Like, essentially, like, if Ronald broke free, he's in on goal and he, so he must take a shot, maybe. So the ref plays the advantage, and then the foul continues into the box, and that's why he gives a pen. Yeah, I don't. I don't know really. It's where I've never really. But then I guess thinking back, because if it's, if it's, a, if it's a tackle, didn't Pedersen's tackle start outside? Actually, yeah, 
I'm sure his tackle technically started outside the box and carried on in as well. So maybe it's yeah. But, I mean, if it's, but if it's like a tackle, then they say like the contacts outside the box, doesn't it? It depends where the contact is. If you go into your feet, if you go into the ground, but then if it's kind of if you kind of if you kind of tussle him with someone like up a bit of upper body, yeah. So he's ran past of... him and he's holding him to try and keep up with him essentially in it. But I, I guess when someone's running faster, eventually you stretch too far where maybe the you're pulling them back enough to bring them down, isn't it? Because they've gone essentially. Yeah, but I guess he kind of initiates contact but completes the foul in the box, I guess. I don't I don't know the ruling, but Yeah, I, I mean, anyway. if anyone does know the official ruling on on that, um I'm not complaining at all, don't get me wrong, uh about the penalty. I just when I was talking to my friend who is a Cardiff fan, he was just highlighting that well he started pulling him back outside the box, so he wasn't sure how that was a penalty and I said I thought it was because the foul continues in. So when like he goes down, he's in the box, so that's why it's given. Because like I said, ultimately you could argue the ref's playing advantage. And then maybe like to stop the advantage, the 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 player who's committing the foul brings him down to stop the advantage if the advantage is dangerous. So that way you would say, Well, hang on, you you've done a, a bigger foul than what you'd already done. I, I don't know. It's kind of yeah, fluid, I, isn't it? So it's hard to yeah. kind of... But we'll we take it. Yeah, we'll take it. I'm just curious what the rule is. be interesting. Um, but yeah, so penalty. Big talking point. Liam Cullen hmm. steps up to take the penalty. And I had bad feeling from the second he stepped up. No, no offence to the to the guy. Really good goal in the first half. Would love to have him to have got two. You know, local academy product and all that. Great to see him scoring in a derby. I just, I've never seen him taking a penalty before, and it's a big game to take your first penalty for the club. Yeah, it's just, I guess you've got to ask like who, who was the penalty taker before the game? Because I think if they, if they changed it, well, it's been Jamal Lowe, hasn't he? Won on the pitch. Yeah, but surely it'll be Grimes. Like, and I still don't know why it was ever taken off Grimes. We we said this before when Lowe missed 100% the penalty record, against. Yeah. Uh, when Lowe missed the penalty against Sunderland earlier on in the season, didn't he? Um, I don't understand why it's been taken off Grimes because he takes some great penalties he has done over the years. So for me, the obvious choice, especially if if Lowe is your penalty taker and he's not on the pitch, that was the obvious choice for me. But then wouldn't even it, I wouldn't have Lowe anyway. I would. I would no, I, I wouldn't either. Grimes. Grimes would be my penalty taker all day long. There's just there's, there's, no, there's no question, but. You know, if before the game Cullen is the taker, then there's no there's no argument. But if they've given it to him for sentimental reasons, because he scored and you know he, he is you know a Swansea fan, and you know then you know I can't get on board with that because no. And I mean, and so it's all hindsight as well. Because if he scores, then great, and we probably yeah. go on and win three and three or four, maybe the way the game was going. Well, but he had another chance. He could have had a trick, to be fair. Yeah, but I think if that, I think. If that if that goes in straight after after it was almost straight after half time, after the first half performance, if we're two 0 up there, I think we I think we go on and win three or four. I genuinely do the way the game was going. I think we would have, you know, the confidence would have gone through the team again. And I think missing that penalty, it was just a, a bit of a oh no, like you know yeah, oh, if they come if they go and score now and we don't win this game after we've missed that penalty, they, it did really it did suck a bit of the life out of it. So then it comes back to being clinical though, doesn't it? Well, yeah, you've got. I mean, he does everything right. He sends the keeper the wrong way. He's just got to hit the target. There's just no excuse. Can't miss. It was the close to being a really good penalty. It was, yeah. But it was like if you have the line of a really good penalty, and you go like the smallest margin over it, it becomes a really bad penalty. So, like, if you think of the post, the left side post of the goal, and you want it to like hit the post and go in, that's like the perfect penalty, yeah, in terms of hard for the keeper to save he was kind of the other side of that <laughs> yeah which which is frustrating it was, it was frustrating a bit too I got hard it, i got it for him i got it for him as well because i think that just would have been class for him as well i think and then he would have been on a hat trick and that just would have been yeah. amazing but you know thankfully we're not talking about that costing us the game because it could well i'm glad you know, because that would have knocked his confidence as well I think. well it would of course it would have and i think like when he got subbed as well he held his hand up as well didn't he so and you know if we'd gone on and drawn the game it would have knocked him you know and we all would have been 
and it would have been a lot more uproar in the post match as well on Sky. He was like, Oh, look, you know, should have been more comfortable. And I, I've got to hold my hands up to that. Harry Darling was in the same interview and he was like, exactly. Don't be stupid, you won us the game. So, like, he, he, did, he did play well like as that. well, to be fair. I mean, Cullen played well. I know he missed the penalty, but he did play well. It was yeah. just, it was more gutting for him that he missed it. And, and I, and again, like I said, I think we would have gone on and won three or four if that had gone in. Yeah. And I think all I will say is just like lucky that it didn't cost us because it could have. I think we're not bashing Cullen by any means. No, no. It looked like it looked like he stood up and was like, I'm taking this. And maybe Fair. that was like, okay, that's fine. I don't know who the penalty taker is. Don't know if Luke Williams discussed it at all since since that incident or whatever. Maybe it is Cullen. Um, I feel like it isn't because he doesn't start every game at the moment, so I feel like I'll be a weird choice to be your number one penalty taker. But I don't know. I don't know who it is. It's the first one under Luke Williams, so it's difficult to know ultimately who he's decided. Yeah, so it could be Cullen. But um, I just feel like whatever has happened, it needs to be right. You're the most composed, and you're quite um, good at taking. You know, like penalties so like for example i would say grimes so he's got good composure and he can he's got good accuracy as well and you are the penalty taker no matter what maybe you have a rule in there that if someone's on a hat trick they get to stand up mm. that's the only thing i would say i go I, back to the the guzman dyer thing in the i, I think that's fair i think that's a nice thing to have as a team yeah. Yeah. um but otherwise i think it should be someone i'm not saying liam cullen isn't composed but i think Mac Rhymes is probably the epitome of it in our squad. Yeah, and, especially in that um, game. He's a perfect player to take that penalty. A perfect yeah. player. It, and it's a massive occasion, right? So, like, if Liam Cullen's penalty taken, he's taken several before, then nobody would really, uh, like, say anything, even if he missed. Yeah, it was a bit you know, of a shock. When I but I think because this is his first one, and he stood up, and you've never seen him stand up before. I felt for me it was like I, I thought like he scored a goal in the first half, he's full of confidence, but I think it's tipped over and he's seen the penalty and he wants to take it. And I think you could see what was gonna happen. That's what I felt watching it on the telly anyway. As soon as yeah, he stood maybe. up, I was like, Oh, he wants he wants to make the headlines against the big rival of his boyhood club through the academy. And he can see them headlines already, and I'm just there like oh, he's gonna miss. And then he missed. I was like we need yeah. to win this game now. Yeah, I, 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 I did panic a little bit after it because I thought you, you kind, of, it's a bit of a momentum swinger, isn't it? When you miss the penalty, you can, it can be a massive momentum swing in the game for yeah. the other team as well, can't it? So I was a bit worried, but you know, you can't really in that situation, like you said, it's all right if you're, if you're, you know, you're three nil up or something, and someone's on a hat trick, different ball game, but you know, one nil up in a massive game, right after half time, you've got, to, you've got to put that away, and there's just no time for sentimental. Reason, you know, there's no time for sentiment, sentimental moments there. But again, it's hindsight. If he puts it in, we're laughing and we're talking about how brilliant Cullen is, and maybe he goes on to score a hat trick. So I don't know. I but he, just he probably should have. Thankfully, it didn't cost us. Yeah, thankfully, and he probably should have scored a hat trick. He had another chance not so long afterwards, where the ball's played in, and he has a bit of a free header. I think you could argue maybe was it like a diving header, but yeah. he just can't direct it on target to get you probably should have scored it to be fair it was a big chance yeah we should have um you know we should have we should have buried that game really the way that we played we had enough chances and i think that's you know you, you've touched on it. i think we leave teams in the game um we leave them have a sniff and i think the longer you know you're only winning one nil or it's nil nil and you've dominated the game Teams will grow into the game. I know, Card, like you know, we made our changes, and Cardiff brought some players on, and they had a couple, <clears throat> a couple of half chances, which thankfully didn't go in. But you know, we've got to start. That's something that they will work on. We've got to start putting games to bed, like, especially when we're that dominant. Because you know, in hindsight, that game was quite comfortable when you watch the balance of play. I know we didn't score a lot of goals, yeah. but on the balance of play, it was quite comfortable. You know, we were. We were a cut above Cardiff in that game. Quite but one nil is never a comfortable lead, is there? And no, no. The, the score, happen. the score line is not comfortable. But when you're watching that game, we were by miles the better team. You know, if if we had gone on and won that game three or four nil, I don't think anybody could have been. Uh, I don't think anybody could have argued against it because we no. were that dominant. And I think Cardiff were that disappointing, to be honest. 
Um, yeah, but I think Cardiff did come back into the game a little bit in the second half. And again, going back to the trends, I was saying, I spotted I'm a static that we won this game, but they were still kind of here. We were winning one nil at half time. And I said, we need to score two to win games at the moment. Now, they didn't score a goal, but it did look like they were pushing and knocking on doors close to the end of the game. We did get, and I was getting a bit twitchy and nervous, I'll be honest. Um, especially looking at what they did to Ipswich last week or the week before, yeah. where they scored two 90 plus minute goals to turn it around from 1 0 defeat to 2 1 win. You know, it was not something out of the realm of possibility that something came from nothing the longer the game went on. And they brought the likes of Ramsey on. Obviously, Tanner came on. He scored against us in the reverse, and so did Ramsey. I was surprised Ramsey came on because a couple of weeks ago he was ruled out for the Wales games, and now all of a sudden he was back for the derby. That uh, was really dodgy. Odd. That was just really odd. I don't just know. Just saying, going on just a bit dodgy. I just, I mean, like I want Wales to qualify and everything, but like when people say Ramsey don't commit to country, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying he's not going to turn up and play for Wales now if he was asked to start or play, but. I don't know. Just the something there, isn't there? Like it's been spoken a lot through his career that he's never fully committed there. Maybe not as bad as Ryan Giggs was. And I know these are big games, not friendly, so he probably does want to be involved. But um all of a sudden he was well and truly ruled out of those games. And then yeah. he was able to come back for the derby, which is like a week before. Yeah, I, yeah, that was that was odd. That was a bit strange. When I saw he was named in the squad, because he they said he was out and then he was named in the squad, and then I thought, oh, he's gonna he's gonna play in the derby. I thought he's they're gonna, yeah, he's gonna make an appearance in the derby. And I just think well, he had one shot. It was a bit of a was it a bit of smoke and mirrors. Do we think that they were always gonna play him? Like, I don't know. I'd love to know what they spent Maybe. on his wages just to try and beat us twice. I mean, it's I tell you, what's weird is he hasn't kicked the ball since like September or something. Yeah, and he just happens to manage to get back from all of his injury troubles for this game. Was he rushed back, and then? Like if he was actually coming back and he was available for the Wales Euros, the qualifiers, and then he rushed back to feature in this one. I'm just wondering, like you know, is that I don't know. I did recovery they, now for. There's so much. There's so much going on because I think like, um, like Cardiff manager came out and said something about the bad communication with Wales and and Cardiff, and then Rob Page has come out today and said something else, isn't he? About like, oh, you know, the communication's fine and all this. So oh my God, I don't know yeah. if there's like something going on there a little bit maybe maybe you know they named him in the wheel squad and then cardiff have stepped in and said i'm just speculating here but this is just something i'm thinking about because they said he was out for wheels then he's named in the squad and they said hang on if you're fit enough to play for wheels then you can play against swansea mm, i didn't know that to be fair maybe he's not all rosy then but that's weird because I don't know. That's weird. It's just weird, isn't it? So he's only played yeah. like eight games for them this season, though. I and to be honest, I, I that's what I would. That's what I would. That's what I'm speculating. I put my money on that. You know, magically he was going to play for Wales. And if I was bad, though, because... if I had stepped in and said, "No, hang on, if you're going to play yeah. for Wales on Thursday, then you're fit enough to play for us against yeah. Wales on Saturday." We would have expected the same for Joe Allen, wouldn't we? But like, it's interesting because we've always said Rob Page and Cardiff is more of a close relationship, and he doesn't really. We've speculated it doesn't have the same level of relationship with Swansea. Um, so it's interesting yeah. to see that they've seen about communication with Wales up there now. Maybe Rob Page is just the issue. <laughs> well, yeah, so that's a whole that's a whole nother podcast, that is. But uh, well, I'm sure we can revisit that in a week or two when we see what happens. But um, yeah, yeah, hopefully we qualify. Just depends. If we get through the first game, it could be quite a tricky final if it's like Poland. Yeah, I know. I think I fancy us against Finland at home in the first game, but um, if it is Poland in the second game, I'm, that's a hard one. But, you know, one-off game at home. We'll see. Yeah. Gone off on a tangent here. Ramsey didn't do anything in this game as the bottom line, so he can score all the penalties he wants at home, but uh, taste the defeat. Um, Again, away. like I said, I'd love to know how they paid for his wages just to try and beat us twice. <laughs> Well, they got off. They got one. They got one win out of it. So it depends if that's valuable to them or not. And we'll get to that in a second. But just to finish this game off, obviously Jamal Lowe scoring his third goal in South Wales derby history. Now, I actually said when he came on the pitch, he wasn't doing anything, and he was quite pedestrian. And I was a bit concerned. He didn't seem to have the same level of press that we had. 
from the guys who started the match. And uh, I just didn't think he was offering as much as what I would have liked to have been offering at that stage of the game. But then he decided to, you know, shut me up, I guess. And he scored a really good goal. And I guess this is just why I get so frustrated with him. Because if you look at the goal he scores here, where he runs with the ball and he does take a player on, and he did the same thing against Ipswich earlier in the season, where he yeah. did run with the ball up the wing and he scored a really good goal, just do it more. Like, just show us that you can, maybe you can be an option on the wing if you do stuff like this more often. Like, just show us that a little bit more. Clearly, got the quality to do it. Just run a little bit more of the ball. Yeah, just seems so clunky all the time. Doesn't do it enough, does he? Just no. like it only in patches, he seems to have that. Yeah, let's, yeah, it's let's a bit of a away from what was a fantastic. No, ball, buzzing, and again, like I said earlier, that uh, like when that when that when that ball at the back of the net, the celebrations that, again it reminds me of, uh, I said Prattley and that forest, that level of atmosphere, all the players running down the the touchline, and Luke Williams running down the celebrations, that it's, it's carnage. But Low is <laughs> lucky it made me laugh because I was screaming for him to just square it. Yeah, it's like the keeper comes out, all he has to do, I think it's Ronald who's next to him. He literally just has to square it, and then. I think you know, he has to score because if he didn't, there would have been ructions. But now, fair play, that was um, that was class. I'll never forget that big celebrations again. He was never passing that ball. Like no, the one no. thing that Jamal Lowe is, he like he does. He's probably got a bit of a selfish streak about him Loves in that sort of situation, which isn't always a negative. And obviously, it wasn't in this case. Um, but he did have to put it in, didn't he? Really? Yeah, he loves a goal. <clears throat> Uh, goal against Cardiff, yeah, very good. Three assisted by Ollie Cooper, and obviously he came on. He had a good twenty minutes or so. I think, I think did, that's yeah. one of the most in, the better most better performance I've seen him play this season since Plymouth away. I think. I don't really think he's had a good year, but no, he hasn't. I hope that whatever he's been doing and he showed on the pitch in this game, we need to see more of that from him because I think he was quite tidy. He showed good work rate. He won. There was one ball that he won just inside our own half when he tracked back, and yeah, that was a massive yeah. crowd boost as well. Because I think that's oh, when that. Cardiff were coming into the game a bit more, and it was a bit like yeah. we're under the cosh now, you know, thinking of the fact they scored two against Ipswich late, and and then you saw them big tackles from players like him, and did lift the crowd, and even the players that, on the pitch went and celebrated that, the tackle. Yeah, that that clip of them celebrating with him is one of the best is one of the best clips I've seen from from the weekend because I think it's Darling, Grimes and Wood all like running absolutely screaming as if they'd scored a last minute winner I just absolutely love yeah. that and then if we should rewind back to the week before when we talked about Bristol and people were slating Wood for whatever happened after the game when he was you know arguing with fans he was he went absolutely berserk there and that's just pure passion and yeah. Grimes you know being the captain is that's my favorite for the weekend you 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 can never say they didn't want it enough we just watch that clip when they go absolutely mental i love that that's my favorite one no it was fantastic and i just hope that the the good feeling he must have had oh yeah for that limited Imagine time that. he had on the pitch yeah. helps him regain the confidence or whatever he needs to get back to where he was yeah he was the best of him on. last year yeah, I just I really him. like him to get back to that level so we can start building again because it was fresh when he came in last year and it was quite nice to see him on a pitch playing well and I think we have missed that and there's a position in the team for him if he wants it. Patterson is in the later years of his life, well, life career, football in life. <laughs> Sorry, wrong <laughs> word. Um, yeah, yeah no. Um, yeah. As much as he had a good season, you know, I think his position is up for grabs ultimately. It, it is. Like he, you're not it saying he true. needs to go necessarily, but he should be under threat of losing it, losing that position, just because of his age. And you know, like he's 32. If you look at the top central attacking midfielders in the league, Patterson's had a really good year for us, but there's definitely more we can get out of that role. Um, and competition doesn't hurt anyway if you can push more up Patterson. He's had a really good season, but I do think going into next year, Patterson's going to turn 33. We don't even know if he's going to have a new contract. To be fair, he might yeah. not even be here next season. That position could be up for grabs, so it's up to all. Yeah, considering to, uh, considering Patterson wasn't that. like really supposed to be, here. It looked like he was going to yeah. leave in the summer, and then I think maybe in Cham going out of nowhere, kept him there. Yeah, he's been he's been good this season, Patterson. He hasn't had like maybe the goal scoring form that he has previously, but I think he's still got a touch of quality, and I think like you saw that in the 
in the Cardiff game, he's still got a lovely like first touch and yeah. passes the ball lovely. I think he's still got. I think he's still a quality player. But but you're right. I don't know how you know long term it's not going to be. It's not going to happen. But that's the same. Um, I think we should touch on like Joe Allen and Norton as well. I yeah, I was I was gonna brilliant gonna player. get to those two. We'll start with Norton. He actually picked up an injury in this game. Yeah. Massive shame. And Josh Key's returning from injury, bit lucky perhaps he was on the bench, although we would have had Abdullah and I guess um Bashir Humphreys was uh, actually Humphreys wasn't on the bench, didn't even notice at the time. Oh he wasn't. Uh, no, but Abdullah was. So I would imagine he would have come on if he wasn't key. Um I was gonna say Humphreys could have gone sent back and moved Darling, but Darling could have gone right. Yeah, I didn't realise that Humphreys he wasn't was on there either. Um Lassar was there. I guess, but he probably wouldn't. He's not really had a league game anyway. He wouldn't want to bring him on in this one. I guess it would have been Abdullah, but anyway, I digress. Um, Josh Key came on and he did look off the pace to me. I was a little bit concerned when he came on because they started being a bit of a threat on that side of the pitch, whereas they weren't when Norton was there. Um, Key was a bit slow in possession, a sluggish. He gave the ball away a few times as a result of just not That's rushed probably, taking his yeah, yeah no it, i'm not criticizing key no 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 i was just saying the moment of norton's injury was a bit concerning because perhaps key had to get rushed into a very hostile and like yeah it's, it's a hard to get up game, to get, it's it? hard to get up to that level yeah, yeah exactly and it's hard to get up to that level tell, he wasn't yeah. quite ready for that yeah. and i, I don't know want, i i <clears throat> go on sorry i just didn't want him to be the reason why like they equalized, do you know what I mean? No, like, but I I know they came into the game, but I don't think they really. I, I you know they had maybe a half chance, but I can't remember them having a like a golden opportunity. I yeah. don't think we were ever like I, at the time. Obviously, I was you know we're worried. It's a massive game. You you nervous and you and they they did come into the game a bit. I think Tanner had a strike that went over, and I think there was a header which Rushworth saved, and but I can't remember them having like dominance in the game i don't like in hindsight i don't think you know we were ever really really under the cosh at any point so norton basically went off in the 60th minute and he lost possession five times in the 60 minutes he was on the pitch and josh key lost possession five times in the remained in minutes on the, on the pitch like 30 minutes or so that he had now essentially twice as often is is the stat there isn't it so Yes. I'm not saying he had an awful game. I'm just saying you could notice there was no, less assurance like... and less composure there. And there was a few times where he tried clearing the ball and he went straight to an opposition or he went like a pass went astray because he just wasn't up to the level of or pace that you needed to be for no, you know, it's where this game was at at the time. And it is difficult. I was just a bit gutted when Norton went off, that's all. Oh, I was gutted because Norton was brilliant and you know, I think he, he was injured when he tracked back and made a tackle as well. He just put, yeah. put his body on the line. You can't you just can't argue with it. it. You know, it's literally given everything for the shirt and he just you just can't just can't fault him. I am gutted he's injured. But I think like with Key, it, I think it's as harsh because he's like, you know, it is hard to come on off the bench anyway in that scenario. And considering he's been out for a long time, and I think the the game was at a different point there, like you know, when Norton was on for that 60 minutes, we were largely dominant and we, and we had possession um, and players were forward. Whereas maybe at that time, like we'd drop back a little bit and there's not so many options where he's maybe just like, like you said, hooked in to clear it. And it's not going to someone because there's not so many bodies forward. It's just a different time in the game as well. Yeah, I don't mean necessarily the clearances. Like there's one or two. No, no, I don't know. To, he was trying to pass in field and it just went to no one and it was intercepted. But I'm not trying to criticize Key necessarily. It's more trying to say, like, someone coming back from a long injury, it wasn't the best time, perhaps, to be brought back onto the pitch and brought into that environment. Um, you still there? I think we've lost Lee temporarily, but I'm, uh, I'm sure we'll get him back shortly. There we go. We should have Lee back uh, on a different device because technology always does favours when you're recording these things. Uh, so if his voice sounds a bit different to you, that's all it is. He's on a different device. We haven't got a long got left mobile. anyway. Yeah, got mobile. Um, but yeah, so not to criticise Josh Key as such, but just saying it was a very difficult situation to be coming back from a big injury in, I think. And I was just glad that there wasn't a goal as a result of him having to come on because he yeah. didn't seem quite 
hundred percent sharpness. If if that yeah, makes that's sense. Fair. Um, Joe Allen as well, and the other one we wanted to mention. So Class. it's actually I just saw the as well. He's he was saying he wouldn't rule out going back for Wales as well, wouldn't he? But I think he has definitely hit form. He's been talking about wanting a new contract. I know we've spoke about it quite a few times in the podcast, saying not quite sure the best investment. Um, I think what we've said is if it doesn't come at the detriment of investing elsewhere, I would you would keep him, you know, because I think ultimately we're going to be losing him and Walsh, potentially. There's two midfielders. So are we really going to go and spend to buy two quality midfielders? Or oh, and Patino be going, so that's three. Yeah. If you can yeah, the, re-sign the Alan on lower wages, maybe it helps. Yeah, the difficulty is just like how much how much are we going to get out of him? Because I know we haven't had him a lot this season. And I've said before, like I, on like I've said on the videos before, I've said I don't know, you know, if it's worth it. Um, just because of the amount. But then now that he's found fitness again, he's back in the team, you just like forget how good he is, he's, especially in that game on Saturday. His calmness on the ball. There were so many times where the game is frantic and he just looks like he's got like so much extra time. He just yeah. he just brings the ball down and plays. He just looks like he's got it all the time in the world. Um I know we can't get 90 minutes out of him, that's for sure. But the 60 minutes he's on the pitch and starting, I don't think it's been, you know, I don't think it's been a secret. I think we've been better when he's been fitter and he's been playing. I think it, it has made us a better team. Um, he's uh, he's played 17 games this year, started five. It's not half as bad as Aaron Ramsey. No, and, I, and, I, and you are right. I think, you know, if there's another option out there that we can get, you know, Instead, then maybe we go down that route. But I think if there isn't another option, then it's a no-brainer that that we keep him because it looks looks like to me, even if we get sixty minutes out of him every week, I think um, that works for me because he's been brilliant. He needs to lower his wages, doesn't he? And I think there's a fair argument to say that that would be acceptable yeah. from both parties to assume. Yeah, that's fair. would be a reality. And then I think there's an there's a discussion to be had if you can agree a certain level of wages that it's fair for the amount of playing time he's averaging. I wouldn't be opposed to him staying because it's difficult to bring in three midfielders in one window that are all yeah, going to exactly. be the quality you're after. So if you know Joe Allen can do a job at a squad level, I mean squad because his fitness probably stops him starting week in, week out. You know he's at a certain level and that level is good enough for what we need when he's on top of his game. But to get to that level, you need to manage his minutes and obviously try and reduce the amount of injuries he has. So keeping him just means we have to then find less to match that level. And even if it's a one-year extension, maybe then he can get replaced next summer when he's 35. And it's easier then to perhaps bring in one quality midfielder this year or one next year. It's probably easier way of rebuilding the team long term. Yeah, yeah. Because I think it's other areas of the pitch that we also need to spend in, and I can't. I don't know. I just feel like that maybe helps staggering it a little bit. If you can, if you can agree to reduced wages, I think that is something that needs to happen for him to renew. Um, so it depends how willing he is to do that. But yeah, he's been quality when he's been on the pitch recently. I think he's been integral to our upturn in form. And I know Felton had a lot of criticism earlier this season. And we defended him quite a lot, and I'd stick to that. But I'd also say I do think when it came to people arguing Patino versus Felton, there's an argument that be said Alan is showing that as a team, Grimes partnering with Alan seems to be working better for what we're trying to do on a pitch. Okay, fair enough. Um, not saying that Felton did a bad job, I don't think anyway, but Alan perhaps does a better job. That's fine. I'm happy to to say that's the case. Um but he obviously can't do 90 minutes. And then Felton coming in in them games seems to be working quite well um, as well. I think it's quite apparent Patino came on like a 90th minute in this game again. It seems to have quite done quite a lot about the um, discussion about why he should be starting week in, week out. And funnily enough, it seems to be for the reasons that we've been presenting for quite some time. That seemed to be again highlighted more because of how well Alan is doing. I think Alan is kind of doing all of the things that is expected, both ends. Maybe you saw some of the attacking glimpses from Patino, 
they are not as necessary anymore. Now we're playing with wingers like Ronald, who was doing all of that work instead. So you don't need the midfield to be doing it, causing that excitement. And I think maybe that's where Patino is then struggling to get into the pitch because he's struggling with the defensive side of it, which is what we really need from our midfielders at the moment, especially where the issue has been the defence and the keeping the clean sheets being the priority. I think that's why Patino's finding it difficult to get on the pitch. Yeah, and I know we've been we've been vocal about it all year, like you said. Um, I think you know, I can I would I never like you know go against both, but I think he's a, I think he's a fine player. I think he's a great player for the championship. I think he's brilliant, but uh, you know he's not Joe Allen. This is a, a different a different kettle of fish, isn't it? But when Allen's fit and playing well, like he's you know he's a top top player. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and like you said, I think having Bolton as a as another option is great for me. I think where we more so we defended Fulton was that, like you said, people were saying that Patino should be starting instead of him. And I was beat, we were beating that door down for ages. There was no way I could accept that Patino should have been on the pitch instead of Fulton because he just doesn't do it enough for me. And I think there was one game, I think it was the Watford game away where he came on for like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And I think he was just, he was awful in that spell. It wasn't like the first involvement, he got pushed off the ball. Yeah, and I think it's um, and a lot of people have just defended him blindly. I think we did a, I think I put a tweet out like after the Bournemouth game when he was horrendous against Bournemouth. I know, and most of the team were to be fair, but that kind of highlighted why he hasn't been started. And the Birmingham away game when he kind of lets, uh, you know, lets his man go for the equaliser. Yeah, and the we, Birmingham we away, yeah, that's the reason we didn't win. Yeah, it's a th- it's a theme. Like I, I just don't think. There's no doubt he's a top quality player, and then you know he'd probably go on to be amazing, and we'd be like, oh god, you know he was he was brilliant. But there's so many parts of his game he's got to work on. Off the ball, being one of them, he just looks so like, you know, lazy sometimes in closing down, and like physically he's not quite there. So there's there's no way I would start him over Allen or Fulton. I, I, there's just no way. No, same. Um, and it's just you know, he's, he's still young, he's still learning, and that's why he's here, isn't he? Ultimately, but there's there's a reason why towards the end of Duff's time, he stopped playing from the start. Sheehan didn't really start him, and he spoke vocally about the reasons, and that's continued into Luke Williams' time. Three managers there, and yes, we've man. said it from the beginning. And no mistake, then is it three managers? All of hands know better than three managers. No, but I think generally yeah, no. the consensus is now that he's not like near the squad, is he? No, and and the upturn in form, uh, maybe highlighting highlighting a weakness in the position Felton were playing might be a fair comment. I don't think Felton has been doing a bad job necessarily, but I understand his limitations and where maybe Joe Allen is more rounded in certain areas. He's, he's yeah. not, he used to play for Liverpool, you know. He had nearly won the league with Liverpool, obviously. He's had a better career and higher performances than Felton has had. And his limitations is his age right now and his injury record. And when he's fully fit, though, he's a quality player. So him going into Felton's position is probably improving the team. And that's fine. That is completely fine. So, like, if Alan's not here and you go into next season with Grimes and Felton, like, yeah, probably do need to get another midfielder in who is a top level midfielder. So you've got more options there. And Felton does a certain job. There might be games where that's required. And that's fine. But I, you know, playing week in, week out, you probably get certain levels of limitations. That can also be true. Two things can be true. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think Patino was ever the answer. And I would completely oh. still defend Felton's inclusion all of that time ahead of Patino. Um, but it's hard to say, okay. kind of say what would have happened because you never would have seen. But yeah. Yeah, but I think um, Fulton became a bit of a scapegoat, didn't he? Kind of, he was the one yeah, that everybody did, yeah. kind of blamed for everything when it went wrong. He became that that person, really. I, I don't know why, because I think I think he's been great for us. And by saying like Joe Allen should start ahead of him, it's not like saying that Fulton is a bad player because he's not. But it's just because Joe Allen is is a good player when he's fit yeah. and he's playing. He's, you know, he's he is a better Joe, player than Joe Fulton, Allen. Like, well, a form. Bad Joe Allen might grow for him, and then it's it's reversed, you know. Like it's not yeah. it's not to say every single week it's the same thing. He's hit form at the moment, and he's on, he's playing really well. And whatever system they're putting out there, and Luke Williams is trying to install in the team, it seems that Joe Allen is helping, helping deliver that in a certain way. We say about managers as well. You say like there's no there's no mistake that uh, you know managers, 
know, if you have three managers that haven't really played Patino, then there's no, you know, there's no arguments. Same with Fulton. Like, he's been here for ages. Every, like, most managers have come in, obviously rated because he's still here and he still plays. And he still plays a lot of games every season and has been, like, a focal point every year under, you know, Cooper, Russell Martin, for, you know, I know Downs came in, but Downs was a great player, you know, so he didn't play as much when Downs was here, but he was still there and he still had a big part to play when Martin was here. And then, you know, Duff came in and played him. Sheehan was playing him and now, um, you know, Luke Williams plays him a lot as well, you know, and, you know, Joe Allen plays well and he does start ahead of him, but still, he's not a bad player. I think if our midfield options, you know, for two places are Grimes, Allen and Fulton, and then if we can add another one into that mix, I think that's a really good midfield squad to have. I can't yeah. complain about that. Yeah, and just um, I guess I mean just to highlight the point as well. Joe Allen started against Bristol, so yeah. you know there is going to be games where it doesn't go as perfectly as as you want. Um, and Jay Felton started in the draw against Watford, so like it's not like that one person in that one position is a result of a certain result either. But um. Yeah, moving forward then. So that's that's pretty much it for Cardiff. Any final thoughts that you want to speak about? I did enjoy the celebrations at the end, a couple of swim aways. Jamal Lowe did it in his goal celebration, uh, which yeah. I thought was quite good. And Jamie Patterson got a rubber ring out um, after the match as well. Amazing. Luke Williams uh, did his uh, his three uh, his three fist pumps because normally yeah. he lets the players do it, but uh, he did give one this time after winning the derby. So uh, well, now celebrations after were brilliant. They're one of one of the best. I think just um, I think winning that game, it's like I think it was it, in hindsight now again looking back. I think it was one of the biggest derbies to win, even though we have done the you know the double double and whatever we've done all that. And that was absolutely fantastic. But this one after we'd lost the first one, like I said, and the season had been what it was, and we had so much stick for losing that first one. And Cardiff were going to do. The clean sweep of derbies because they'd beaten Bristol twice and they were finally <laughs> double over us and they were so many points ahead of us and they were this absolute brilliant team coming down here and then for us to like comfortably beat them in the end was just massive. It was such a big win. And it's not just that, I think you know, it was a much needed three points for us. We needed those three points. Cardiff were in form coming into the game. It's a really good win. Yeah. No, it was a really good win. Um but apparently it doesn't matter to them that they lost because it's not that important. Yeah, that's tough. That. I, I, I'm fed. I'm fed up with this argument. I think they've got to say that now because we've been so dominant. Like, what was I, the yeah, stat you pulled earlier? Oh yeah, the stat was. I think Eleven since, games was it? Yeah, 2019 was the first time we played them since we were relegated. That's kind of like the new, um, you know, where we are the current time. So since 2019, I think it was 10. Ten times we played them, we've won seven and drawn one, and Cardiff have won twice. So the only two games they've beaten us in ten games is, uh, you know, the, the COVID one, uh, yeah. and this season earlier on under that. No good record for them, but they were singing before the match about like having a clean sweep for derby wins, weren't they? So like they say now they don't care and it doesn't mean much. Um, after the match, or uh, the, what was the one I replied to one on Twitter? Um, you know, who, um, Paul Abadonato is that how you say his yeah. name? Yeah, obviously, he was sprouted a load of rubbish like he always does. Uh, pretty woeful performance by that by Cardiff. Too many individuals had an off day, and some didn't seem to get what the derby means to Swansea. Don't know why he highlights. What the derby means to Swansea? Wouldn't you say they don't get what the card, what the derby means to Cardiff? Like that's what we were saying when we lost. Yeah, Michael Duff yeah. didn't get what the derby meant to us. They've lost, yeah. and he's saying some players didn't seem to get what the derby means to Swansea. That's yeah, weird. I don't know. Yeah, but that's I think weird. he's kind of downplay his need just by saying yeah. like, oh, you know, they it means a lot yeah. more to them. And, and then he goes on why it's the be-all and end-all for them. Yeah. Always have to match that first. Hopefully, Bella will start Colwell, or I don't care about that bit, whatever. That's rubbish. <laughs> um, and then someone replies to him, always meant more to them, and I'm not just saying this because we lost, but they are the smaller side, so a rivalry always means more to the smaller one. We are absolutely shocking, though, how he can keep finding excuses to not start Colwell as baffling. That's, 
anyway um how, how two things how are we a smaller club now and the second thing how, like i don't understand or are they just trying to say how it means more to us the fact that they post in these tweets in the first place shows it bothers them enough to post their stuff but they're saying that it means more to us and that's the reason that they lost because we had more passion essentially it's just yeah, it's, it's uh, hypocritical on the bigger scale yeah but it's the easiest it's the easy it's the easiest argument to make isn't it when when we when we because we've been winning and when we've won, and when i say like these 10 derbies we've won seven of them we've not just won have we? we've been quite comfortable in a lot of them and i mean we've been quite dominant in those performances you know there's been three nils four nils you know and even when we won two nil on saturday we were comfortable and we, the one nil where ben wilmot scored but we've dominated that game as well it's just been like clear dominance for so long and i think the only thing you can say in defense of that is like oh well you know well it means more to you to beat us like we're the big team so you raise your game for us and all that it's just an easy throwaway excuse isn't it because it has been that dominant and that's just the only thing they can say at this point you just be yeah. like oh well because you want it more so yeah we do want it more and that's why we do win it that's not like to say we're a smaller club it's just that you know our players are getting up for it and you can say that yours aren't but there we go that's that's your problem and they need to get up for it yeah but apparently it was like amazing and aaron ramsey had saved the day back in september when they... well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. like when they beat us finally after like all that they finally got a win in front of their fans because they hadn't beaten us in front of their fans since corker um because the other one they won was behind closed doors um we didn't do the end of it there was all Tana murals everywhere and videos yeah. and everything and then they say and it means more to us we didn't you the end of it yeah yeah and and how how they were like finishing ahead of us this season like everything they they were literally winning the champions league this year and we were getting relegated like that's all you've viewed all season and now all of a sudden it, it doesn't matter anymore and it's like um, oh yeah they, anyway, they are, it means more to them yeah. i replied to this because obviously you've got to because i just thought it was quite hilarious um simply with two screenshots now we're on twitter so i used twitter because this is where the conversation was, just replied with the picture of both the club's pages. Now, Cardiff's following on Twitter is 398,000... 398,000 followers, sorry. Um, is that right? 398k. If I said that right, I've confused myself. Yeah, 398,000, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, I don't know why I said 100,000, sorry. So 398k followers, and they started their Twitter page in May 2009. Swansea's is 1 million followers, and they started in January 2012. So they had less time, and they've got just under three times the following. Now, I know Twitter's not the be-all and end-all, don't get me wrong, as the guy would like to reply and said, what, is this your metric? Well, you're on Twitter right now, so it was easy to compare here, but like, Surely that says something because it's a social media. Social media is a global social platform it's where people go to follow things they like, talk about things they like, whether that's football, other sports, politics, whatever. You know, it's a, it's a forum basically where people talk and discuss things. You're only going to follow something if you enjoy it. And I know not every single person that follows either one of them is probably a fan, but it is a decent metric to show the scale of whatever organization it is and the reach of that organization. So it's quite a stark difference considering they're a bigger club. Now that's just off the pitch metrics. You could look at other social medias or other like anything really. Um, how would you define what a bigger club is these days? Because if you look at oh, recent yeah. success as well, they've had two years in the Premier League where two individual seasons where they didn't stay up either time. We had seven consistent, continuous seasons. We last won a major trophy when we won the League Cup in, what, 2013, 2012, yeah. um, We also had European football within the last, I was going to say 10 years, but it's just outside now, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? In yeah. recent history. Um, I don't see any of those things from them in any of our lifetimes even. So... What, where do you judge what a bigger club is these days? Um, the other thing I want to add to this is the whole like comeback of, there was another one. It was like, well, um, we had a really bad performance, but we're still their capital, so it's all okay. 
why do they think why do they think saying we are your capital is offensive in any capacity like i just don't understand it so they actually sit there and see that and think do you know what i got them i've actually got them we are yeah, but, the capital city i got them yeah but that's like but like i said that's what what else can they say now like after such dominance the, the only excuses are going to be you know you really get into the bottom of the barrel here yeah. just by going oh we're a bigger club and we're a capital city then yeah but like the great. capital thing for me surely that's worse for you that you're pointing that out so you're the capital city yet you're not doing as well so if you're yeah. the capital city you'd argue you've got you know a bigger pool of players to choose from a bigger pool of fans to come support you you should make more money as a result. You know, if you're the capital city, you're in a bigger place. Generally, that should mean you should be better and you should be doing better, and they're not. They just lost the game. So I don't see how you can go and then shout about being a capital city when, in your own eyes, you just lost to what is the smaller city. Yeah, I think... Well, why, I think it's just, why would you be proud of that? I think it's just one of the reasons why... The derby is what it is in the first place, isn't it? Because it's, it's like the it's two just big It just makes me giggle every time I see someone have a, uh, say it. So, like, I um, I think I tweeted about it, just saying, like, someone said, didn't turn up whatsoever, still a capital, regardless. I just said, well, such a proud football and achievement. <laughs> and, and then the other tweet I did was just saying, like, imagine Chelsea or Arsenal or West Ham fans just being like, Ah, oh, Man City, they're winning all this stuff, but with a capital. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, they just won the Champions League for a third time in a row, but do you know what? We're the capital, boys. <laughs> it doesn't matter, yeah, we're the capital. So like, it's just so stupid, like, honestly. You, like, keep saying it, because, like, whatever, but I just... I thought, like brilliant, I thought a brilliant tweet as well. Someone said uh, it was something along the lines of, and I haven't been able to sleep like since the game on Saturday because Cardiff is still the capital. Yeah, I know, but like, I just, it's just funny to me how they genuinely think they have got something when they sing that chant or they say that phrase. I just, it baffles me, honestly. It baffles mm -hmm. me. But yeah. um, on that note, I think maybe we should call it a day. It's been, yeah. uh, been a long one. But we have had a lot to talk about. We haven't been here for a while, so it probably was always going to happen. I'm hoping that we can get back to more consistency soon. Like I said, not going to put a time scale on it, but hopefully it will happen soon. But yeah, thanks again, Lee, for joining me. I hope you had a decent week, obviously, with the Derby win. Yeah. Sheffield Wednesday away. Away? Yeah, Sheffield Wednesday away next. We're recording this on, well, Wednesday the 20th, so it's just over a week. Just over a week away. Yeah. International break of the focus turns to Wales. I love the Easter weekend in the championship. The Friday, the Good Friday game and an Easter Monday game. Man, it's two massive games Wednesday and then QPR home. I yeah. love the Easter weekend. And then it seems like you're getting into the proper business end of the season. I love that. I, I mean, love that in the gym. Two very winnable games, but they're both going to be fighting for their lives. But if we can get back to back, if if we can get back to back wins there, I know I said earlier, I don't think we're in relegation fight anymore. But it's done and dusted for me if we can win them. Oh, if we win both, it's done. But I think. We've got to win. We've got to win one. I think we've got to. We've got to win at least one of them. I think. I mean, last season, after we won the Cardiff game, we really turned up for the rest of the season. I'm wondering if we might see something similar. I hope so. It's a game they can breed confidence, can't it? The way they played, I and mean, so yeah. hopefully. I hope they can take the momentum forward, but we will find out in the coming weeks. So thanks everyone, as always, for uh, listening or watching. If you are listening on any podcast platform please take the little bit of time that it takes to give us a review. Uh, click the five-star button. If depending on what platform you're on, I think Spotify, you can only rate with the stars. And if you're on Apple, you can submit a review as well. We would really appreciate it. It helps, it helps us grow and supports us as a channel and podcast as well. So really appreciate everyone who takes the time to do that. Or click thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube and leave a comment as well. Let us know what your favourite part of the Derby Day win was and why, let us know in the comments below. And don't forget, as always, to click the subscribe button for all of our content. It will be coming back to a little bit more frequent soon, promise you. 
Um, so keep subscribed to make sure you catch everything that we do upload. Um, and on that note, we shall say goodbye and see you in the next video. See you soon.